It's my pleasure to be here today and be able to give you an update on the Sustainable Farming Fund project management of giant willow aphid. For those of you unfamiliar with the project, I'll begin with a brief introduction to our project team and tell you a little bit about the aphid and the damage that it's causing. So Scion's leading the project, and from Apiculture of New Zealand, we have Barry Foster as our chairperson, along with John McLean. Some of you may have seen Trevor Jones speak on this project yesterday. He's representing both the New Zealand Poplar and Willow Research Trust, as well as Plant and Food. We also have representatives from regional councils, River Managers Group, Zespri, and New Zealand Apples and Pears. So the giant willow aphid, or GWA, has been known to be present in New Zealand for about five years now. We're not sure where it hails from. We think maybe Asia. In any case, it's now present throughout the world wherever its host trees, willows, and poplars are grown. Interestingly, in New Zealand, we've also seen this aphid feeding on apple and pear trees, as well as some of our natives, Caprosma and Potosporum. Unusually, it's a stem feeder. It feeds on the hard, woody stems of its host plants. But like all aphids, it's feeding on plant sap, and it secretes a great deal of honeydew. If you look at the blue arrows on these pictures, they're pointing to colonies of giant willow aphid feeding on stems. And underneath this, um, it's, it's like a light rain is falling as the honeydew comes from the aphids. And this resource is really attractive to honeydew feeding insects such as wasps and bees. It also um, causes the growth of sooty mold on the surfaces of anything that the honeydew lands on. And you can see sooty mold is present in the two images on the right side. So the impacts that giant willow aphid causes are either due to the direct feeding or they're because of the honeydew that's produced. So giant willow aphids can be present in vast numbers on a tree and it puts um, willow trees under a great deal of stress and we've seen branch dieback in willows in New Zealand and also death of some trees. Um, although there are a few species of willow thought to be pests in New Zealand, by and large they're really important in the New Zealand landscape for things like slope stabilization and also of course as a resource for bees. Looking at the right side, the honeydew deposits. This is a brand new resource in New Zealand that's um, highly abundant. And in association with this, we've seen a great increase in wasp numbers. It's also been causing cement honey for certain beekeepers if um, bees gather enough of this and bring it into the hive. And the sooty mold is a nuisance in itself. Um, it's also a problem for, for example, kiwi fruit growers if they have a willow shelter belt the honeydew can blow in on the wind and settle on the fruit and cause sooty mold on their fruit. So thinking about solutions to control giant willow aphid, um, for a fleeting moment, someone thought um, pesticides might be a good idea. We can inject uh, willow trees, um, but of course this would put bees at risk because these insecticides could um, be taken up by the aphids and excreted in the honeydew and be gathered by bees. So the best solutions are ones that are long-term and require quite a bit of investment. This is what we're working on in this project. Scion's focusing on biological control, and plant and food are looking at host resistance. So at Scion, we're looking at classical biological control, which is going back to the place of the origin of the pest, looking for natural enemies there, and bringing those in to help control it here. Um, parasitoid is the best option for this, because parasitoids, unlike predators, can be highly specific to their target host. Now looking at the image on the right side there, this is a willow tree in Japan, and those are the remains of aphids. These are called aphid mummies. So the parasitoid has grown up inside the aphid and uh, now left behind just the shell of the aphid. Um, looking at the image below, this is a trial at um, Massey University in Palmerston North where we looked at 15 different um, tree and shrub willow clones. And we did see some variation in the susceptibility to giant willow aphid. And we've already had um, some, a good outcome here. We've released two early flowering male clones of a willow hybrid to regional councils for planting out into the New Zealand environment. And uh, we're hoping this can also be one that's added to the trees for bees planting list as well. So for the rest of this talk, I'll just focus on the biological control work we're doing at Scion. 
So looking into the literature, um, very little is known about this aphid, but there were some reports of a single um, parasitoid, Poesia saligne, that's been feeding on this aphid. Um, it seems to be highly specific because it hasn't been reported from anything else. And it's uh, known to be present in several Asian countries as well as California. So we undertook some scouting trips in the first year of this project. We went both to Japan and California to take a look, and we found giant willow aphids in both locations, much more difficult to find than they are in New Zealand. Uh, we did find evidence of parasitism as well in both locations, but only in California uh, did aphids that we uh, collected produce parasitoids through rearing. So that's um, one of our colleagues at the University of California, Davis, who did rearing for us. Those are the wasps on the bottom right that have emerged. They're only about two or three millimeters in length. You may hear me use uh, Poesia, wasp, and parasitoid all interchangeably. Um, so the next step was to gain Environmental Protection Authority and MPI permission to bring this into New Zealand, which we did. Um, we then undertook two trips to California to go and get the parasitoid. Uh, the first time that I went, they were exceedingly difficult to find, the aphids, and those that we did bring back turned out not to contain any parasitoids. So we turned to citizen science to help us out, um, using the platform iNaturalist and contacting amateur ecologists. We had a great response from this, and um, we got one really hot tip, which was uh, for downtown Oakland. I don't have time to go into the story, but there's kind of a fun article on it in this uh, latest issue of edition, edition of Scion Connections, of which I have a few more copies. Um, so this image is showing downtown Oakland, that city hall in the background. Um, with the latter is Stephen Siebold from the USDA Forest Service that came to help do the collection. On the right-hand side of the image, you can see um, some tortured willow trees, and this is where the bulk of our collection came from. This is showing how the collections were made. So short sections of willow stem were cut. Um, they contained aphid colonies. These were placed in a plastic vial uh, with a moist uh, piece of cotton toweling. And we found previously that the aphids could live for several days under these conditions if kept cool. They were triple contained um, to meet the MPI requirements for transport. And that's a picture of me. Very happy to have cleared customs with my live insects. So I uh, went straight to Scion's invertebrate containment facility in Rotorua, as per directions, where these American aphids were transferred one by one onto willow stems of New Zealand willows. Then we looked for mummies beginning to form, and as they form, we placed them individually in gel caps and looked for um, the parasitoids to emerge. We've been doing this daily since mid-December. Um, we've now reared about 2,200 wasps and um, we're tracking them all. And the ones that we use for experiments, so to continue further colonies or to use in testing against New Zealand aphids, we've been feeding honey. So the one in the bottom uh, picture is feeding on mesh um, with some honey smeared on it. It helps them to mature. And the image is showing me on the right uh, releasing a male and female into a cage with New Zealand giant willow aphids. So for the first month or so, we, we had um, nothing but fun just watching these wasps. Nobody's worked with them before. Um, the two larger images are showing on the left a female wasp approaching an aphid colony. And on the right, you can see she's curved her abdomen underneath her body to make a sting into an aphid. It takes only about three seconds or so to lay an egg. The aphids are quite defenseless against this. The larger ones will try to kick the parasitoid away. And the image on the bottom is showing uh, an aphid that was dissected 10 days after being stung. It's really hard to believe, but this aphid was still walking around with that giant parasitoid larva inside its body. It reminds me of a talk yesterday saying how us as humans are really more bacteria than human. This aphid was certainly more parasitoid at this point than aphid. Um, this would have very shortly um, pupated, this parasitoid, and at that point the aphid becomes a mummy. And it's only a few days after that that the parasitoid wasp will become an adult and chew its way out of the aphid. So the bulk of our work from now on in is testing this parasitoid against 
aphid species in New Zealand, particularly native aphids, to make sure that it would be safe to release in New Zealand. I don't have uh, time to go into the list of aphids that we have chosen, um, but I can tell you that we used um, help from uh, David Toulong of Plant and Food Research, who's an aphid expert, to come up with this list. We've covered all phylogenetic groups of aphids represented in New Zealand, so that's all subfamilies and tribes, and also some iconic species. So there's a few aphids in New Zealand um, that come from ancient lineages that can be thought of as the tuatara of the aphid world. Um, that's one on the top right there, that's an aphid that's on Totara. And uh, it's been a lot of work and it's still ongoing to locate all of these aphids in New Zealand, collect them, um, find and cultivate their host plants, and learn how to rear them. Uh, it turns out they all have very different personalities. And uh, there have been a few challenges along the way that were unexpected as well. We collected some natural enemies when we collected some of these aphids. So um, some of them came in to our lab with their own parasitoids and with a pathogen. And some of these colonies were wiped out completely by these. The picture on the left is showing uh, one of the parasitoids from one of our native aphid species. I have no idea what it is. It's not in GenBank. It's probably new to science. Um, and we are still looking for the elusive aphid found on beach, which is one of these ancient species. Um, but we have a good lead now in Christchurch, near Christchurch. Um, we're just waiting for spring to go looking for it. So just briefly, how do we do this host specificity testing? Uh, we take 30 aphids of a given species and transfer them onto their host plant, allowing them to settle overnight. We then introduce a female wasp that's been mated and matured for 24 hours. We then take her to uh, another cage afterwards with giant willow aphids. So this is to make sure that she does sting and create mummies on the giant willow aphids, so she wasn't a dud for any, any reason. And then we regularly check for mummies. This is quite a bit of work. These experiments go on for a month. And we're working with aphids. Um, Aphids reproduce like mad, as you know. So we may start with 30, but we can easily have 300 or so by the time we're doing our last mummy checks. And a lot of them are very, very small. So this is uh, an image on the right showing us looking for mummies on a Mulimbekia plant. Um, the results to date have been very favorable. So we're completed, uh, we've completed testing on two native aphids with no sign of any parasitism. And neither have we seen parasitism in a very closely related exotic species that's present here in New Zealand. Uh, so it's looking good. Um, still more testing to do. And if all goes well, and according to plan, we'll be applying to the Environmental Protection Authority for a release of this parasitoid. Um, uh, we'll be making that application next autumn. Um, part of that involves public engagement. And part of that also is uh, we need to have a good understanding of the impacts of the aphid to make her case. And so for that reason, we've designed a survey aimed at beekeepers. So we need your help to understand how this is or isn't affecting you. And um, most of you, I think, will have received a link to this via an email. That's the best way to complete the survey. Um, there's also a poster on it. Uh, it's out in the poster hallway. It's the very last poster, unfortunately, placed facing out the window. <laughs> Um, but it contains other information on how you can fill this out. Um, that's where our Science Connections uh, articles and a few other articles are sitting in some wine barrels as well. And as some incentive, you can win one of two $50 fuel vouchers. Um, so I'd like to thank all the other supporters I haven't mentioned of this project, um, as well as Apiculture New Zealand for granting me the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you. <laughs>